So, a little bit about practicality before we go any further. Uh, we're an international e-commerce business. We've got 80 staff based across four countries. Uh, we're 10 years old or so now. And we've done a lot of work, cross-border, wholesale, retail, branded, helping businesses understand opportunity, areas for growth and profitable growth, which is the most important aspect of all of that. And here is a, a brief list of some of the people we as a company have worked with. And at the bottom, some of the people that I've personally worked with. Uh, bottom right being Fulton Umbrellas. So a few years ago, I was a regular visitor to the Spring Fair and it is still as big and comprehensive and interesting as ever. So what are we going to talk about today? Trends, category killers, visual discovery, selling solutions, hyper convenience and that's one of the key trends we'll come back to. Changing trading patterns, what promotional activity is going on, why, what's happening out there, what do you need to do about it. Marketplaces for which read Amazon because Amazon is certainly in the Western world at the moment the, uh, the gorilla in the room on that front. And then a few thoughts on 2018 and what's happening and what's likely to happen retail, wholesale, uh, cross-border as well. So, category killers. Can they disrupt an established product category with a new proposition or premium positioning? Well, I, I don't know about your Facebook or LinkedIn page, but mine has often got little things like Uber is the world's largest transport firm, owns no cars. Airbnb is the largest booking for hotels and accommodation owns no hotel rooms, uh, Alibaba is the world's largest retailer and owns no stock, and Facebook is the largest media company and generates none of its own content. So if you're looking at disruption, all of those are businesses that have really gone in, thought about what the convenience for the customer is and put two and two together through technology to make a difference. So they're springing up everywhere. Uh, a couple of areas that have grown in the past couple of years incredibly is mattresses. Uh, so we've got Casper and Eve are the two really big ones and they have just grown out of all proportion to what you might think they're doing. And they've got a wonderful proposition, 100 day money back guarantee if you're not happy, the unboxing viral videos, the delivery, all of these are top of the range services that are pushing the established players like Dreams. I don't know if anyone noticed that Dreams have reinvented themselves recently. They now own sleep. So Dreams is about sleep. It's not about mattresses, it's about sleep and how that after eight years your whole life goes to hell if you don't have a mattress that really works for you. So they're changing their proposition and that's what's doing it. That's what's changing the direction that these guys who come in with a totally different proposition on a mattress that's rolled up easily deliverable and they've got that proposition really nailed. So how many of you recognize this brand? Anyone recognize who these guys are? Mojave's. They have taken an unbranded category of slippers and made it cool. Now that's something I thought nobody could ever do but that pair of slippers you're looking at cost nearly 80 pounds. And all of a sudden, you've gone from a proposition where you got nothing. You had no differentiation. You'd go to M&S, you'd go somewhere. Now, through visual, through social media, through retargeting, all of a sudden, you've got a very cool proposition that people are paying for. So from 2014, they've gone from nothing to being a multi-million pound company, all through social and online advertising. So partly, how are they doing it? Visual discovery. It's interesting. A few years ago, you'd go into Google and type your search in. Now, your ways of searching are expanding. So you've got visual and sound. Oral sound, I'm not quite sure what the correct word is. Alexa to its friends. Spoken search. They're just changing the world. But let's pick on visual for the time being. So. Mojave's in particular have been very canny how they've done this. 
They use Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, all of these social channels that certainly for my generation, it's sort of, oh, don't go there. It's Facebook about as much as I go into. But they really help you discover it. Now, when I was researching for this uh, speech today, I w found Mojave's within less than two minutes, wherever I went on the web, whether it was Facebook, The Guardian, whatever newspaper I was reading, whatever article, they were all over me. They're using that visual discovery to just keep reinforcing their message. That visual content is doing a really great deal. And it's allowing early adopters to become advocates. So what they do is get people in early. We'll touch on this in a minute, but it's all about getting viral and using content and virality, virality to get it forward out there in front of the right audience. I don't know how many of you have been reading in the paper about how YouTube uh, Rabbit Warren and Luke helped Donald Trump a year or so ago. But it's about the algorithms they use to get content in front of people that they think they're interested in. And that's how this is working as well. So this is Pinterest, and that's another great way of doing it. So this is visual search. You just go in on Pinterest. This is a straight organic search for navy blue home accessories. And you get beautifully curated content put in front of you. Now, if you do that through viral or just through content, that's great. It will really give you something. But here, what Pinterest can do, they've got some uh, predictions, different search, Scandinavian interior. But all of a sudden, you've got brands putting themselves up there with clickable links that take you through straight to the product page to sell. So these are guys who are now starting to blend that content and selling at the same time. And this is one of the big things that is going to keep on growing. So you can see home base, which you wouldn't, well, apart from that home base is now disappearing into Bunnings. Uh, and I'm not sure how long they're going to change uh, that focus. But MADE certainly are doing an awful lot on this visual search and the ability to get beautifully curated content in front of people and encourage them to buy straight away. So you can click straight through to that product and buy it immediately. Another brand that has done phenomenally well. Does anyone know this brand at all? Gymshark. Now they have grown in the past 12 months from less than 12 million to 41 million pounds of sales. And in a market where you've got Nike, Adidas, Lululemon, the whole works out there, that is a phenomenal achievement. They've done it primarily through social media, through contacting the right influencers and bloggers, and visual content. So you can see there's you know, very healthy looking, young, attractive people on that. But also what they've done a lot of is reaching out to these influencers. Now, this Nikki Blackletter was a health and fitness blogger from Los Angeles. Relatively unknown a couple of years ago, had a decent following. Jim Shark sponsored her. And in return for that, she posted all about their content they posted about her, so you get this symbiotic link of content happening. She's putting lots of pictures of herself up in, uh, yeah, puts lots of pictures of herself up there anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but it's all visual and written content. And this is what Google, this is what all of the search engines are looking for now. New content. What's new? What's additional? Visual content, written content. It makes a massive difference. So the actual paid search budget, and the actual real advertising budget for these guys is incredibly low. It's all come about through social, viral and content marketing for them. The other trend that we're noticing is that people are selling solutions, not just products. So you're trying to think wider than just a point sale. You're trying to think, what's the wider issue that we're dealing with here? Now, these guys, the Dollar Shave Club, uh, they came about because men, we grind our razor blades to death because replacements are too expensive, too tedious to get, particularly in the States. They actually lock them in cabinets and you have to ask people to get them out for you. So it's damn tedious to get the damn thing. So they recognised a gap in the market because Gillette gouged you on price, 
and they were difficult to buy anyway. So they really identified that. Now, two years ago, they were bought for nearly a billion dollars by Unilever, and they've just launched their UK offering. But what they're really focusing on is convenience and solving a problem for you, giving you a solution to a problem. So, yeah, so you, you can still buy a razor blade, but actually now it just comes to your door, it's convenience. So convenience and problem solving are what they're really focusing on to you. They've also had a massive side effect in that uh, Gillette's market share is tanked, and they've gone down 25% in their market share on razor blades and the overall price of razor blades has gone down 25% as well. So it's a net benefit to everyone. But it's a real interesting focus there. On top of which, we come back to the point we said earlier, it's solving other problems. It's content hub for men to find out about lifestyle things. So when you're looking for razor blades, you're not just paying for it through Google on the paid search. Google loves content. Google will push you up to the top if it thinks the content you're promoting is relevant to the search that the person is putting forward. So not only are you solving a problem, you're doing yourself a whole load of favour on your findability on Google by promoting all of this rich content about your lifestyle and what might ma matter to a, the millennial man as he gets through into his raising and re shaving and lifestyle behaviour. So it's working on both sides of the coin there. Another brand which has done quite a lot on this, is Graze, which is subscription. It started off sending healthy snacks to your desk. You could pick once a week, twice a week, five days a week. But it was all healthy, all really nice snacks. Now, they've branched out hugely. Two or three years ago, they started supplying M&S and Sainsbury's with the point-of-sale snacks. So instead of a Percy pig, you could buy a nice healthy snack. They've now gone into the US. They're in over 30,000 stores now, globally. And they're getting their model sorted for delivery and subscription into the US market. So to a degree, they're solving a problem that nobody even thought existed, which was how do I get regular healthy snacks? So they're getting it to you. They're tweaking their recipes and menu for the US market, palette slightly different, and it's taken them some time to do it. But they've got that convenience and subscription. So I'm snacking at my desk, I don't want to eat a chocolate bar, how do I do it healthily, how do I do it without thinking about it, that's their focus. And again, a lot of their content, a lot of their approach is through social media and content marketing. It's people advocating, saying how much better they feel after they've changed their eating habits at work, how much healthier, how much weight they've lost. So they're piggybacking again on that dual benefit of visual social content. Moving back to stores, what else is happening? This is a John Lewis store in London. And it's one of the trends we're noticing, and I'm sure you're seeing in, in your daily shops, that the space in stores is changing. Increasingly, it's about services and it's about approach. So now in London, I need to get the exact number for you. One fifth of the space in the London store of John Lewis, Oxford Street, is given over to services rather than product. So this is encouraging people to interact with the brand, with the John Lewis in a different way to who are interacting before. Because they know they can go anywhere to buy goods, but you can't get John Lewis service anywhere but in a John Lewis store. So what they're doing is changing the whole makeup of the store. They've got 11, 12 increasing number of services you can book online, you can get in there, actually go straight in for a personalised service in that store. And it's only going to increase. We're working with a small independent chain of department stores at the moment who are looking at their first venture into online. They're not selling. They're wanting to put services up there first to bring people in and give them that rich experience of what's happening. So there you go, some of the services that you can get almost to the level of the Apple Genius Bar that they're doing as well. Other things that are changing is payment. Now, how many of you heard of Klarna? Klarna started out in continental Europe primarily because people don't have the same penetration of credit cards when you look in Germany, Scandinavia, Holland and the like. It's a deferred payment method. But it's increasingly, as we go to cross-border, people who 
well, you want to sell to who are not in the UK will buy more because you've got this service on there. Pretty easy to put on, makes a massive difference in your conversion rate if you're looking to trade outside of the UK directly. So we mentioned convenience and hyper-convenience. It's, it's very much a I want it now society we live in. It's funny, I've been working in a little bit further east than Europe recently, and the biggest challenge is that last mile delivery. If you go into the Middle East, there are no postcodes. So it's really difficult to find out where people are. So you don't know you need something until you haven't got it there and you're trying to say, well, how do I get it to you? Well, I'm the third tower block on the left down this road, I'm on the fifth floor. It doesn't work. Hyper-convenience is what we're all crying out for now. So whether it's Deliveroo, I mean, love or hate the zero hours economy we're in, people love that convenience of being able to just order from your favourite takeaway, get it delivered, track that delivery to your door through the right app so you know exactly when it's going to turn up and you've got everything in front of you. It's what people are looking for now. Again, the people who've driven it are Amazon. So we've got Amazon Prime, Prime Now, all of these other services. So this is how people like Argos are rising to that challenge because they're coming up with same day delivery, 395, seven days a week. Other brands are looking at following the subscription model for Amazon, which is you pay a fee, whatever it is, 80 pounds, $100 a year, you get free deliveries next day for that whole period of time. It's how do they challenge that? People want convenience. Much. Which way you look at it, when they click the button, they need to know they're going to get it in that time frame. And if you can't do that, then you've got to manage your expectations accordingly. So, talked about delivery and cross-border trade. It is a massive trend at the moment. It dropped in December as people wanted things quicker, which is what you'd expect. You're ordering pre-Christmas, you want that security that you're going to get your goods prior to Christmas. But at other times, it's up to 33% of deliveries are cross-border from UK businesses. Now, that is a huge volume going out there particularly when you're looking at then controlling that delivery channel, it really is a challenge to get there. So the UK has led in these delivery methods, but continental Europe is following along very quickly because they see that there's a massive uptick in availability in there. In fact, again, Carrefour, the big supermarket chain, French-based, announced a week or so ago they were totally revising their business to focus on click and collect and short-term delivery options away from the store to give customers that degree of immediacy and convenience to their offering. Changing trading patterns is interesting. A couple of years ago, who'd really heard of Black Friday in the UK? It just didn't exist the way it did in America. But I think this was a, a 2014 shot it just hit, hit the zeitgeist straight away, and it was chaos. And it has changed the whole trading pattern. We used to have what we called Cyber Monday, about the 5th of December. First Monday, second Monday in December, depending on how early it was. Now, we've got Black Friday, Middle East, they call it White Friday, and then they've got this, chaos is ensuing. So it's changing the whole dynamic and shifting customer buying patterns in September and October particularly if the weather is a bit milder, those patterns are shifting entirely now. So not only have you got Black Friday, Amazon figured out there was something in that lull between sale time and the launch of autumn winter season that needed filling. So we got Prime Day in the middle of July. And that's just something that's totally made up out in the middle of nowhere. But more deals than Black Friday, not quite sure how successful it's been in terms of profit generation for the brands on there, but in terms of pure volume throughput, it's incredibly successful for them. So all of a sudden you've got another anchor point in there to start working to. Now, I'm sure everyone recognises Nicole Kidman. How many people recognise the other guy on the screen? Jack Ma. Now, this is a shot from Singles Day, which is 11-11 all the ones that was uh, 
last November time, this was shot in last November, £26 billion sold through Alibaba on that day. Uh, and this was just to show that they're holding while they click the top, the, put the clock around on it. Again, it was created out of nothing. It's two to three weeks earlier than Black Friday. He's looking to make it a global event. So all of a sudden, you've now got another trading pattern to deal with. So you've got Singles Day, Black Friday, Cyber Monday. When do you go to sale? Is it the 24th and you can't get delivery beforehand? Do you go earlier because you've missed out? These are the things that are making a massive difference to how the retailer has to think about it. And if you are thinking of going to China, we have a China report that will give you all of the relevant China dates for uh, sale because we're about to go into Chinese New Year. That's another massive time, another massive marketplace opportunity in that market. So, Amazon. Now, there, there's a love-hate relationship that most of us have with Amazon. I don't know about any of you, but I, I, I buy because it's convenient, but I hate myself for doing it. Because you think, oh, I'll just click and it's done. I want to work with small businesses, but Amazon are just that gorilla in the room. And sadly, they're just going from strength to strength. I dug up some numbers last week. Quarter four last year, their sales were 60 billion which was 37% up on the previous year. And that is a business that, by all intents and purposes, is an extremely mature business. So how can they keep growing at that level? I don't know, but it's something that you can't ignore. And it's creating their whole, whole ecosystem. Now, people will tell you it's anything between 29 and 55% of product searches will start on Amazon. So it depends where you go to the 55% the was only a very small sample, 29% was about a 5,000 people sample. Whichever way you cut it, it's a big percentage of people will start looking to buy a product on Amazon. So the question you have to ask is, is it the right place for me? And that includes the echo and the voice search that we talked about earlier. So not just written, but voice as well. And it's creating a whole ecosystem in there. So this is a search for picture frames, which is a relatively generic product. But all of a sudden, you've now got people taking over, working and managing Amazon in a way to create a point of branded difference on their network. It's easier and cheaper than doing it in Google and in the wider ecosystem, but still, you have to work very hard with Amazon to get here. So you can create points of difference, but it's quite hard work to do it, but it is beneficial to get to that top part of there. So there are opportunities on there. So the question you have to ask yourself is, is there really a market? Is there a market already for my product? Is there a demand out there for the products I'm selling? Do you still make an acceptable margin? Now, Amazon are a little bit opaque at times, particularly if you wholesale to them, because they will cut the price of your goods, believe me. They'll tell you they won't, the algorithm will do it. They have no control. If you want to start trading, start as a marketplace operator. Don't wholesale to them. Uh, but again, if you're going fulfilled by Amazon, it's quite difficult with low vo well, high volume, low margin products because it does take away a lot of your margin. You have to look at what you're selling, who you're selling to and how you want to distribute. And are you prepared to play in their trading environment? We're already touched on Prime Day, we've got Black Friday, they're going to follow Singles Day. All of that will be margin eroding and demand marketing money from you. This is not to say you shouldn't, it's to say be aware of the giant you're playing with when you get onto Amazon because it's not a simple environment. It's getting very complex to play on there now. And do you want to target international markets? Now, within the UK, you can turn on five mar European markets very quickly now, because if you've got the same listing, it will work in France, Germany, Spain, Italy, one other, can't remember. But you can get in there very quickly. So the question is, if you want to start trading, how do you turn that on? And if you're operating the Fulfilled by Amazon, it can be very easy, but there's a cost associated with it. So all these things are quite interesting to get into. They're not going to slow down, 
They've just bought into the Middle East. They bought Souk.com and are putting a massive investment into the Middle East. Australia they opened up last year and Alibaba and Amazon are fighting out in India between them at the moment. They can't quite figure out who's going to win, but there's massive marketing money for both of them in there. So if you're in the ecosystem, it's got great coverage, just have to figure out if it's the right profitable opportunity for you to get into it. Just talk about other businesses that suffered from Amazon. Toys R Us. Uh, 10, 20 years ago, that was the category killer in the toy world. They destroyed the local toy shop and virtually killed the market. Now, it's just had a CVA. It's very likely to drop into a full administration and fold because it didn't move with the times. Its customer service was shocking. Amazon beat it on the one hand for price and availability. One of my colleagues waited 45 minutes for a click and collect item in Toys R Us pre-Christmas. So its product offering was not differentiated, massive amount of working capital tied up in stock, poor service doesn't lead to a great experience. On the other hand, in the same market, the entertainer. Incredibly successful business and still doesn't open on a Sunday other than online. It's gone up 13.5%, online 32%. It's doing a huge overseas delivery because it's focused on customer centricity and service. Yes, they have to have a lot of stock, but they're focused around the customer and that experience rather than just knocking the goods through. So you've got two businesses which have reacted very differently to the threat of an Amazon coming into their market. One has failed, arguably. The other one is delivering fantastic sales and profitability through different channels. So Amazon isn't the only game in town, but if you compete with it, have a point of difference. 2018, crystal, crystal ball gazing time. So what is going to be happening next? Well, quite surprisingly, the, uh, when the Retail Week did ask some of the consumers about where their spending was going, it was not as negative as you might think. So the vast majority of people said expected to spend the same, some people less, some people more. So it was broadly neutral about what people said. Well, they say positive there, I don't know, I think I was being kind when I wrote that. I think broadly neutral about what people are planning to spend next year coming up through. But what are the trends that, are, you know, we've seen businesses go, Easter's gone, Joe Bloggs has gone, Debenhams and House of Fraser have had particularly bad Christmas seasons that they declared. Uh, I'm not sure who's taking bets on going next, but I wouldn't be surprised to see that Hoff or Debenhams had some problems in the next few months. And I was at an event last week, and some of the trends that were coming out from there were quite interesting. I've already talked about content, and you can't emphasize that enough, particularly user-generated content. If you can get your consumers, whether it's ratings and reviews, blog posts, or anything like that, to post about your brand, your product, that is gold dust to you. Google loves it. The search engines love it user-generated content, your customers love it. They value what they're saying about you more than what you say about you. So if you can get user-generated content, that is the ideal. Payment methods. We touched on Klarna. Payment methods are increasing, particularly on mobile. About 60% of searches are now conducted through a mobile device, either through voice or written. So if you can get the payment method sorting out on a mobile device easier, you'll get engagement, you'll get conversion. That's a critical factor for you. Convenience hasn't ceased in its importance either. The other thing is AI, artificial intelligence, coming slightly further down the chain, away from the big boys, into uh, productized solutions like chatbots. Now, a chatbot is essentially an online communication tool, like when you pop up and said, can I help you here today when you type it in? but purely driven by artificial intelligence. They're becoming quite affordable now, and they make a massive difference to engagement because people love talking about their needs. If they can get the right algorithm, they're doing a fantastic job for you. So just looking at online sales growth, it, it's not slowing down. A number of brands and retailers we're dealing with all of their growth is being driven by online sales or click and collect where you're bringing people in and the sales actually made online.
Growth of home is continuing in the online category massively. Beauty is, gro is growing. Electricals, it's virtually saturated. You know, electricals are one of the first areas to go online, so you're now not getting much growth in there anymore. But online-only retailers will continue to outperform the market. So there is a massive opportunity, but you need to know, you need to fully understand what you're getting into and why you're getting into it. Just creating a website with a view that if we build it, they will come, is not a strategy. You need to be clear in your objectives and your goals from it.